6 o'clock news starts right now. And we begin tonight with a major setback for a nonprofit that's in town to honor fallen first responders. So the organization is called Saving a Hero's Place, and they came here to honor the San Antonio Police Department. But instead, as John Pavaraja shows us, it's the SAPD helping them after someone broke into their truck last night. It's anger and then just heart broken, you know, because you you know now this is going to take some time. Nonprofit Saving a Hero's Place made it into San Antonio last night with plans of making honor chairs for two fallen San Antonio police officers. Instead, their truck is being sent to the shop after being broken into. How vital is this truck to y'all's operation and what y'all do? Uh, extremely vital. Like, it's the only way to get the, the trailer where we're going. Uh, it's a fairly heavy trailer, um, so that's, that's why we have this truck. Founder of the nonprofit, Tommy Capel, says they left the truck in their hotel parking garage off of 1604 and Stone Oak Parkway. That's where suspects damaged the door handle, took a saw that they used to make the honor chairs and specialized taillights. I think it's going to be over five grand. I said those taillights have sensors in them, and that's why they take those taillights. Capel hoped to build two honor chairs next weekend for San Antonio police officer Joseph Cisneros, who passed in 2021 of COVID-19, as well as for officer David Evans, who was shot multiple times in 2003 and ended up dying from his complications to his injuries in 2022. You sit in the same seat. Every roll call, it's a superstitious thing. Like you made it through your last shift, your last shift. So now when you go to roll call, you need to sit in that same chair. Our hope is that we can replace that empty seat with a, a customized chair that has their name and everything on it. Capel isn't sure how long this will set them back, but says that no matter what, the job will get done. And their message of end of watch does not mean the end of a legacy will get across. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Tonight, Converse police are investigating a shooting that injured a man. Here's what we know so far. It happened on Meadow Hill Street in Converse. Police are saying that when they got there, they found a man who had been shot. Right now, he's in the hospital with critical injuries. Police haven't told us his name or even what led up to that shooting. Converse police also didn't give any details of any possible suspects. In other news now, neighbors say that a man who is believed to have shot his wife and then killed himself opened openly shared that they were having some marital problems. San Antonio police found 52-year-old Miguel Sauceda dead and his 51-year-old wife wounded inside their home on Champlain Drive near Nacogdoches Road last night. They say the couple's children called for help after escaping the home. Neighbors tell us the husband was a kind, helpful neighbor to them, but recently seemed troubled. My boyfriend went over there and talked to him to see if everything was okay, and he was talking to him about the divorce. Court records show that Miguel Salceda filed for divorce back in October. Police are calling the shooting an attempted murder-suicide. Now this man, 22-year-old Christian Roque, is behind bars. Police say that he robbed the Macy's at South Park Mall and then threatened a security guard. That was last month. An affidavit states that Roque and a woman stole several boxes of perfume and then ran to the parking lot. And police say that when a security guard caught up to them, Roque allegedly reached into his pocket and told the guard to back off or he'd shoot. Police haven't arrested the woman that they believe he was with. The Bear County Sheriff's Office is asking for your help identifying this man who broke into a home in the 10,000 block of Emerald Sun and he had a gun. BCSO says the homeowner's surveillance footage captured the man kicking down the front door of the home. Once inside, the man was holding a gun the entire time. The home was vacant at the time and the man left without appearing to take anything. But if you recognize who this person is, call the Sheriff's Office at 210-335-6000. It's Easter weekend. This morning, thousands of people line the streets of downtown San Antonio to watch the Passion Play. It's really a local tradition. When people here started doing it in 1983, the actor playing Jesus at the time had to lift a 150-pound cross. But today, that cross is a lot loud, loud, lighter. Excuse me, it's about 50 pounds. In the Passion Play, Jesus is condemned to death and forced to carry his cross. He falls several times, he's stripped of his garments, after which he's nailed to the cross, and then his body is taken down after he dies. The crucifixion was depicted right in front of San Fernando Cathedral. And since it is Easter weekend, families will be camping out at city parks this weekend, another San Antonio tradition like no other. The city lifted the curfew at parks for the weekend, and they're asking a few things of campers. Keep it clean. 
bring your own trash bags to keep your campsite tidy. Recycling bins are available at the parks and remember no glass containers are allowed. The park curfew res resumes at 11 p.m. on Easter Sunday. OK, so if you're looking for places to egg hunt, you have plenty of options this year. Tomorrow, Bear County Parks and Recreation is going to have an egg hunt at Woodlake Park at 10 in the morning. So will Chicken and Pickle at 11 in the morning. And then on Sunday, the Tower of the Americas is going to host an Easter egg extravaganza that starts at 11 a.m. Also, St. Thomas Episcopal Church is going to have a hunt at 10 in the morning. So we just went over four events, but there's a full list of more egg hunts that are happening around our city. We have them on our website, ksat.com. A lot of people, of course, focusing on the weather for weekend festivities, campers out in the parks, and yes, the egg hunts. Adam, you've been talking about a little drizzle for Sunday. Yeah, more like foggy mist, almost a drizzle, right? If you think back to last Sunday, it was just enough to make it feel a little damp, but didn't really make things overly slippery, if you know what I'm saying. So yes, we will have uh, some foggy, misty dampness every morning all the way through Monday. That includes Easter. 78 right now, dew point of 57. Southeasterly wind breezy throughout the day. Steady now at 21 miles per hour, gusting to 28 most recently in San Antonio. You look at the gusts. They're generally between 20 to almost 30 miles per hour, and it's going to remain breezy through the evening. Wind gusts still between 20 and about 30 miles per hour through the night on into the day tomorrow as well. And it's that wind coming off the Gulf of Mexico, so you're, it's going to increase the humidity and you'll feel the mugginess first thing in the morning tomorrow. Rising humidity, more spring-like conditions, but not for too long. Another cold front's on the way. We'll talk about it in a bit. All right, thanks, Adam. Let's take a look at traffic out there right now. Or the lack thereof. I-37 at Jones. A lot of people hopefully getting a jump on the holiday weekend, getting out of town or headed home early. No traffic concerns right now. Yeah, this time yesterday we did have several traffic hotspots, so it's nice to see that people are at least with their families, or we hope so. Switching gears now, the city of San Antonio and the union representing its firefighters began negotiating today on a new contract. The union wants a big payday for its members whose pay has actually shrunk next to exploding inflation. But Garrett Berger tells us that we still don't know how big of a pay bump they want. Health benefits, overtime, testing and scheduling. They all made appearances in the first exchange of proposals between the city and the San Antonio Professional Firefighters Association. But for the union, base salary will be the basis of the deal. That cures a lot of ills. After the end of their contract in September 2014, firefighters went more than six years without a raise as they fought the city in court, at the ballot box, and the negotiating table. The next contract that was finally forced on both sides in an arbitration process the union had demanded was nothing special. Altogether, it means firefighters' pay has only grown 10% in a little under a decade, while inflation has been about triple that. And the last time around, our proposal was much more generous than that arbitration award. Um, so, you know, that, that, that is the decision they made. This time, the city proposed five years of 4% raises. The union's team recognized the comparative size of the opening volley, but didn't agree with it. When I see 20% over five years is I see additional pay cuts over the next half decade. That's what I see. The union wants a shorter three-year contract with an upfront bump to help make up lost ground and annual raises. But something was missing. We don't see an actual wage proposal. The union's president said they deliberately left out hard numbers. He says their members wanted to see what the city would come out with first. They know that we've been suffering. They know that it's 10% over 10 years. They know that it's a 20% pay cut. Let's see what they think of us. Now they know, but what remains is what exactly the firefighters think their pay ought to be. The fire union did agree to put forward a hard proposal by the time the two sides meet again next week. I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Happening right now, the largest crane in the eastern seaboard is picking up the wreckage from that bridge collapse in Baltimore. The Navy sent three giant cranes hoping to refloat the cargo ship Dolly. It is a tough task, though, because the section of the bridge that collapsed weighs more than 9 million pounds and will need to be cut into pieces before it's lifted off the ship. There are still four construction workers whose bodies have not been recovered yet. It took the Coast Guard three days to find the remains of the first two victims. In most instances, 
our divers cannot see any more than a foot or two in front of them. Maryland requested $60 million from the federal government for recovery efforts, and President Biden signed off on that within a few hours. We want you to stick around. Coming up next week is going to be the beginning of National Life Donate Month. We're explaining to you what that is and also how you can become an organ donor. With just more than a week before the eclipse, how are rural communities across South Central Texas preparing for a big influx of people? Coming up tonight in the night beat, we're taking you to the town of Vanderpool and how they say they're preparing for this eclipse like they would a flood. While school districts in the heart of San Antonio are seeing a decline in student enrollment, those out here in rural communities are seeing a boom. On the night beat, we take a look at which districts are seeing the largest growth. April is just a few days away and the Texas Organ Sharing Alliance is raising awareness all month long to get more people to become organ donors. It's an important thing. According to the Alliance, 10,000 people just here in Texas alone, they're waiting for an organ. Earlier this week, Daniela Ibarra spoke with expert panelists about the importance of organ donation, becoming a live donor, how donating works, and also the benefits of it. This is happening as April marks National Donate Life Month. Just education is so important. Um, one thing that we also stress to people that if you do join the registry, it's great to have a conversation with your family about that. So that way it takes the burden of that decision off of them at the time that you do pass away. So your family knows exactly what it is that you would have wanted. So on April 3rd, KSAT Community is going to host a phone bank to help people register to become donors. You can learn more about the phone bank and see the entire organ donation town hall on our website. KSAT.com. A couple of recalls to make you aware of right now. Kia has recalled more than 427,000 Telluride SUVs. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, that SUV can roll away while it's in park. All Telluride vehicles made between 2020 and 2023 and certain 2024 models are affected in this recall. Owners are asked to take the SUV to a Kia dealer to have an updated electronic parking brake software installed. Kia will reimburse owners for that repair. Subaru also recalling nearly 120,000 Outback and Legacy vehicles over potentially faulty airbag sensors that may not just deploy during a crash. The recall involves the 2020 through 2022 model years. So if you have one of those vehicles, take it to a dealership because if you do that, they will replace the sensors for free. We are getting closer to the total solar eclipse. And as you know, South Texas has a front row seat. That's why KSAT has you covered for everything you need to know about the big day. And right now on KSAT.com, you can head to the Eclipse Authority tab for a list of events leading up to April 8th. You can also check out a really cool interactive map that shows the complete path of the eclipse. It shows who's in totality, who will not be in totality. Adam, you've been talking about this all week long because it's really going to make a difference on that day. Yes, you know, some people are thinking, oh, you know, I'm, I'll be about 99%. No, 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 no. You need to be 100% in totality to get the effects. For some people, that means driving from the Northern Hills neighborhood just over to the airport or even McAllister Park. You need to be within totality. And, you know, it's 10 days out now and it is within the reach of our model guidance. However, be very skeptical of what you see the forecast for Monday, April 8th, this far out because of our erratic weather pattern, particularly numerous cutoff upper level low pressure systems these patterns are notoriously erratic and I don't think we're really going to get a really good sense of how much cloud cover we're going to have for April 8th that Monday until about a few days out. You look at the last 10 years and it's been a mixture of everything from mostly cloudy conditions to mostly sunny conditions. But I did the 30 year average and the average amount of sky covered by clouds is about 40%, which is still better odds than the rest of the path of totality through the lower 48 here. All right, let's talk temperatures. Don't put the jackets away quite yet. You're going to feel the warmth and the humidity this weekend. However, early or middle of next week, temperatures drop again. Mornings back down into the mid 40s. As for today, I love the 
layered clouds. That's why I love looking at this time lapse. You've got the low clouds, the high clouds, all moving in different directions, being steered by their respective wind flows. 59 this morning, 81 for our high temperature. And notice the record, 94, set back in 2000. Just gives you an idea of the potential this time of year. But I don't think we'll be getting into the 90s anytime soon. Currently at 78, dew point of 57. Here's the key though, that wind out of the southeast at 21. It's been breezy throughout the day, a little gusty. It's going to remain that way through the night, but the key is the direction of the wind out of the southeast, bumping up the humidity. You'll notice that mugginess later tonight and especially into tomorrow. Temperatures across the state, not bad, 70s and some 80s, 82 Midland, 76 Abilene, 88 Laredo. Laredo actually hit 90 earlier today. That was the warm exception across the Lone Star State. Rio Medina now at 78 and 76 in Converse. As we go through the evening, breezy, increasing humidity. It's going to lead to some low clouds developing overnight as well, and even some patchy fog. And temperatures warmer than what we've had previous nights. 68 at 10 o'clock, midnight we're at 64. And then tomorrow we start the day in the lower 60s and then make it into the low 80s by the afternoon. 81 for the high temperature and those low clouds will give way to some afternoon sunshine. But you go along the Rio Grande tomorrow, closer to 90. Del Rio, Eagle Pass, Catula, 88 the high, even Laredo making it to 91 for the high temperature tomorrow. We get into Sunday on Easter. A little bit of morning dampness just in the sense of fog and a little bit of mist and some low clouds. So gray start to the day and then just a few peaks of sunshine into the afternoon. Mid 80s for highs though. So feeling spring like with the extra humidity temperatures well into the 80s. But then the cold front hits early next week and by Wednesday we're looking at high temperatures only in the low 70s for next Wednesday and Thursday, and that's below average for this time of year. All right, let's talk about our next chance of rain. Don't get excited about it. It's just a small chance, but at least there's something out there to give us a little bit of hope. This counterclockwise spin, that's the upper level disturbance that's headed our way. That's going to make it here with the cold front and some upper energy by Monday night. At that time, most of the rain to the north of us, North, north Texas, Oklahoma, and parts of the Panhandle. For us, we'll be right on the tail edge of a thin line that's likely to develop, and we could just get clipped by a few brief showers or light thunderstorms as we get into Monday night and early Tuesday morning. That's a 20% chance, so nothing to write home about and nothing to get too excited about. Big story is the changes. Spring like this weekend, then we get into next week and it's kind of fall like, I guess you could say <laughs> it's a little reversal. Now coming up at 645, you know, we're nearing the end of the month. A look back at our temperature and precipitation statistics. All right, we'll see you then. Thank you, Adam. So is UT ready for the Sweet 16? They sure are. Madison Booker, a big reason for that. She's helped the program to so much success up to this point. And tonight, a trip to the Elite Eight is on the line against Gonzaga. Plus, Jetty Osman is in a contract year, and he wants to stay in San Antonio. Hear his mentality with nine games to go after the break. At the end of December, the Texas women's basketball team lost their All-American caliber junior point guard Rory Harmon to an ACL tear, which teed up freshman Madison Booker to step up as the new court leader for the Longhorns. Booker has since become the first freshman to win Big 12 Player of the Year and is now preparing her team for a Sweet 16 matchup against Gonzaga in the NCAA tournament. That game tips off at 9 o'clock tonight. Booker's success at this point didn't come without a few hiccups and she stayed the course. Head coach Vic Schaefer tells us from his vantage point how she was able to do it. First, you got to give Madison credit. It wasn't easy early. Like that first five minutes, if you go look at our Baylor game, like she's throwing it all over the gym. I mean, fifth row, eighth row, you know, rolling it off her foot. I mean, I had to get her out and set her down and calm her down. And then she came back in and was fine. Um, I think we, you know, the, the other part is, has not only she a, a, is really accepted and embraced her role and likes it now, part of that transformation is because her teammates have just encouraged her and been there and supported her through it all. 
Yeah, she is must watch television. Booker in one seed Texas tip off at seven o'clock, excuse me, against the Zags at nine o'clock in Portland with a ticket to the Elite Eight on the line. Nine games remain on the San Antonio Spurs schedule. The final stretch starts with playoff bound New York tonight at Frost Bank Center. Although San Antonio isn't a part of the playoff picture for the fifth consecutive season, the team still has expressed an urgency to try and win out. At this morning's shoot around, Jetty Osman, who is in a contract year, says he wants to stay with the Spurs and talked about his focus as the offseason nears. I just have to keep doing what I, what I what I'm doing like every time, you know, uh, and that's like coming off the bench and bring the bring energy, play the right way, um, and uh, and that's the only thing I can control, you know. Um, so uh, obviously everybody wants to finish, you know, the season on the best note, uh, and obviously I want to finish on the best note. So, but really I'm just having a lot of fun, you know, especially the last couple of games. Like like I said, we played really good, and everybody's having a lot of fun. So that's what I'm really, you know, uh, happy about. And I'm just trying to uh, have fun and be excited for the, for the rest of the games. The Spurs have been plenty fun to watch since the All-Star break, that's for sure. New York and San Antonio tip off at 7 o'clock from Frost Bank Center. So how was that for an opener? Yeah, it was incredible. Um, I mean, just the whole... The whole process going out there on taking the field, uh, the fans, it was, in, I don't know, it's hard to describe how amazing it was. Um, you know, watching the replays of the whole World, World Series and then dropping the banner. And, you know, I'm trying to go out there and get ready and go about it normally. And it's like I felt like it took me five or six pitches and I was ready to go. It was a magical opening day at Globe Life Field for the Texas Rangers yesterday. The club unveiled its championship banner and won in a thriller in extras against the Cubs. Of course, there had to be some drama. Jonah Heim overcame a disputed tip with a walk-off single in the 10th. Texas won 5-4. They're back in action tomorrow. As for the Houston Astros, they'll look to bounce back from their opening day loss in Game 2 of a four-game series against the Yankees tonight at 7-10. Baseball's back. I love it. Back. All the drama. Thank you. All right, coming up next, we are talking about ways you can lower your property taxes, what you need to know and what you can do this weekend. We'll be right back. A property tax bills will be in the mail soon. Dun, dun, dun. And mm -hmm. there are ways you can try to lower the amount you have to pay. Yeah, this weekend, the city of San Antonio is going to be hosting something called property tax help sessions to explain how to do that. The next one is going to be tomorrow. Basically, you just go, you ask questions about your property taxes and you get help and you see if you qualify for any exemptions or tax breaks. OK, we're going to talk about all you need to know with Sarah Wamsley Estrada, the housing policy administrator with the Neighborhood and Services Department with the city of San Antonio. She joins us now. Sarah, thank you for being here. Uh, first of all, let's talk about this weekend's workshop, but we do want to mention if people are already going, my calendar's full, it's Easter weekend. There are several more workshops throughout the next several weeks that people can go to. So what can they get out of these workshops? Thank you all for having us. So this weekend we're hosting two property tax workshops and what we hope people leave with is an understanding about what their tax notice says and understanding about the different tax exemptions that are available to homeowners and how they can appeal the appraised value of their homes if they think that they're too high. So these sessions are co-hosted with Texas True Tax and our friends at Bear Appraisal District also attend them. We're hosting them in every single council district so we can really reach households all across San Antonio now through the protest deadline, which is in mid-May. So what folks will see is a presentation that's about an hour long explaining the basics of the tax exemptions, how to protest your taxes. And then after that, uh, they can actually have the opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one with a trained volunteer who can share specifics um, about how to protest with them or help them file their exemptions. We want people to get the most out of uh, these sessions. So as far as tomorrow, if people go to tomorrow's session, what should they bring with them? The most common thing that folks will need to bring is a Texas state ID. That can be a driver's license or just the regular IDs that are issued. If you're going to file for any exemptions, um, such as a disability exemption or um, a disabled veterans exemption, then you're also going to want to bring your disability award letters uh, or your VA notices. 
what are some protest tips that you all give people? I mean, what are ways that someone can actually try to lower this if the appraisal district has said, no, this is what we think it's worth on paper? Yeah, so um, a lot of the tips involve just gathering evidence around your home, um, taking pictures, even getting estimates of repairs that you know you need. Sometimes you can even find errors on your appraisal if you request that evidence package from the appraisal district. For instance, it might say that you have a fireplace with a chimney and they've raised your value because they think that you have that. But you're in your home all the time and you know that uh, that fireplace is walled in and you couldn't use it. So that's something that um, you can provide evidence for and lower your property taxes, just as one example. Also, when uh, people protest, they tend to bring in uh, property tax values in their area to prove if they want to say, hey, this house is identical to mine and it's $20,000 less. Is that something that you would also recommend? Yeah, absolutely. And in that evidence package from the appraisal district, they'll even tell you which properties they used as comparable ones. So um, a common tactic people use is saying, I don't think this property is actually, actually comparable because of X, Y, and Z reasons. What's the success rate here? How mm -hmm. often do you actually see someone's property tax rate be lowered? So the good news is that the success rate is really good. About 90% of people who protest will be successful at lowering their appraised value. Um, but the people who have the most success come prepared with the evidence to make the case. So I'd encourage people to show up and learn more about how to do that. But if you're on the fence, know that protesting your taxes can't increase your appraised value. It can only lower it. So uh, it won't hurt you to do it if you're nervous. What do you think people usually miss? What are some missed opportunities for people after? Because some people don't even bother to protest because they, they think ah, it's not worth it. I'm just going to waste my time um, and it's going to be a huge headache. But you from the other side of it, what do you think people don't take advantage of? What exemptions? Um, I think a lot of people forget that their homestead exemption is not automatic. So if you have moved recently, bought a new home, um, remember that you need to refile that exemption. Uh, and the good news is if it's been a while and maybe you forgot, uh, those exemptions can be retroactive as well. So that's a good reason to file them and get those credits. You know, in San Antonio, uh, a lack of internet access is still an issue. So if somebody actually goes to these workshops, is that something you all can help with? Because sometimes not being able to get on a computer is a yeah. big hindrance here. Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the best things about these workshops is that um, in our packets, we have all the forms that you might need to file for an exemption, and the appraisal district is right there to accept them on site. So if you don't have a computer, this is a really great way to make sure that you do get your exemptions. And even if you're not sure, um, we can help you check and see if you do have an exemption or if you need to file for one. Okay, so you can fill out the paperwork to protest and then hand it to the people who need it, kind of like a one-stop shop? Exactly. Perfect. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, also, do you know of any laws or rules that are being proposed in the Texas legislature that people should be watching out for as far as their property taxes are concerned? So last year, voters approved Prop 4, which increased homestead exemptions. So that makes it even more important to get your exemption. Um, next year, we're not sure what has what's in store for us at the legislature yet, but we do know that the city will continue to support measures to reduce the tax burden. Our city council has already taken steps by raising the city's homestead exemption to the state allowed maximum, which is great news for city of San Antonio residents. Um, and of course, we'll continue sponsoring this campaign to make sure that uh, everyone's taking advantage of the exemptions that they're entitled to. Okay, perfect. Now we just wanna let people know that tomorrow's session is going to be at Reagan High School. It starts at 10 a.m. and then there's also one on Monday. You, we flashed it on your screen just a moment ago. There it is at JT Brackenridge Elementary. That one on Monday starts at 5 p.m. All of the stuff that we talked about, if you want any more information, that's the website we want you to visit. It's sanantonio.gov slash property tax help. Sarah Wamsley Estrada, thanks for being with us and sharing some time about this important service. Hope people take advantage of it and have a great holiday weekend. Thank you. All right, coming up next, after the break, the percentage of Gen Z and millennials looking to get into therapy, it might surprise you, but what's actually stopping them from doing that?
New statistics show that 93% of Gen Z's, Gen Zers and millennials want to improve their mental health this year. Here's the problem. 22% of them, they don't think it's going to happen. Producer Haley Powers explains why it could be difficult to find a therapist. I'm in therapy. I need help. These words are hard for many people to say. The stigma of seeking therapy is decreasing, but it's still out there, and a lot of people are afraid to admit they might need help. The Thriving Center of Psychology released a new report about Gen Z and millennials. It shows the top three reasons these groups are seeking therapy, including anxiety, depression, and stress. We don't have the access to homes. We're not moving out at 18 and then just getting our lives started. Um, we're not all getting married in our early 20s. And then you add all the political strife, you add all the, the difficulties with kind of getting through our daily lives and the financial struggles. It's just getting harder and harder to kind of just survive. So what can you do if you need some advice? Find a therapist, but don't settle on one. Dr. DeGain says finding a therapist is similar to dating. Give it a couple of tries, and if you don't feel comfortable... Your first therapist may not be your last therapist. When it comes to picking a therapist, Dr. DeGain says find someone who works with your schedule, finances, and most importantly, to go in with an open mind. The unknown is always scary. That's what kind of makes it that in the first place, but... Growth is also part of the unknown, and you won't really know until you try. People here in Texas are looking for help. San Antonio ranks 28th out of the top 30 cities with people interested in getting into therapy. Austin, Fort Worth, El Paso, Dallas, and Houston are also on that list. There's the political um, differences that happen even within the state. There's the kind of pushing down of mental health um, support and the, the rise of the stigma around that. On top of political differences, social media also takes a huge toll on our mental health. While it's meant to connect us, it can end up tearing people down. It also shows people's best sides. You don't see the struggles they're going through, how difficult things are, how long it takes to get certain progress. You just see the end results and you start comparing to the best and it makes it really difficult to understand the humanness of everyone else. Self-care is also important for your mental health. So put down your phone, get outside, see family and friends, and don't be afraid to get help. Haley Powers, KSAT 12 News. No, it's true. And the important thing is that you get out there and that you get help. Talk to somebody, yeah. even if you, do, you can't find a therapist. Now, here's a live look outside right now. Oh, so pretty on this Friday evening, 77 degrees. You know, you might be thinking, uh, you know, it's a good idea sometimes to look back on the month that we've had and say, OK, well, what kind of weather did we deal with this past month? Adam Kasky has more on that. Yeah, and I'm going to dive into those details in just a few minutes. We'll take a look back at the month of March. I mean, it's coming to a close. Easter Sunday is the last day. Then it's April Fool's Day. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's always a good day. We might just have to bring the megaphone back. I don't, trust, I don't trust that smile. Yeah. Woo oh, it's so fun <laughs> to sneak up on people with that. All right, 78 degrees out there right now. By midnight, we're at 64. And tomorrow morning, not as cool at 61. Higher humidity on the way, spring-like, but just for a few days. We'll talk about it more in just a bit. <laughs> Kasky's dancing. Fiesta Month is just around the corner, and already you can buy your tickets for the exclusive KSAP Fiesta Party for the Battle of Flowers and Fiesta Flambeau Parades. We have a link to buy tickets on KSAP.com. You can also scan the QR code you see right there in the bottom of your screen. I can't believe it's less. It's in like four weeks. Yeah, you can get prime seating to watch the parade, two tacos, one drink, access to a cash bar, and there's also going to be an easy-to-get-to bathroom and a chance to meet some of the KSAT crew. Yeah. The bathroom, that is the, key. Yeah, I the know. The porta potty. Those <laughs> yes. parades. Oh, that's clutch. Yes. And you know how um, there's a flyover for, you know, a military flyover, right, for yeah. some of the parades? I get to ride in an F 16 leading up. To <gasps> yeah, we're going to get some awesome. cameras. Yeah, it's going to be oh, awesome. Oh, that'll be cool. Oh, I can't wait. It's going to be great. I want to push the limits of that plane in my body. Let's do it. Are you going to take the Gosky Don up there with you? Well, Look, I was wanting to to drop confetti if we could, right? <laughs> you know, you could drop leaflets, whatever, but just drop spray confetti all over the place. The city would love it. <laughs> We'd go viral. They would love it. Everybody would come to San Antonio for a fiesta after that. Mm -hmm. Confetti from the sky. All right, let's get back to reality. A spring-like weekend, cold front early next week. And we will turn cooler than average again. Now, speaking of temperatures, let's look back at the month of March. We're almost three degrees above average. The warmest day 
was 91 earlier in the month. It's hard to believe because we've been relatively cool recently and the coolest temperature we've had was 41 degrees. As for rainfall, not so great. Notice we had several damp days, those days in green where we had at least a trace of rain or even some measurable rain, but even the days of measurable rain, it wasn't that much. We only had 88 hundredths of an inch and we're well over an in inch below average. 24% of Texas is considered in drought. Some of the worst drought across the state is right here in our neck of the woods, particularly Hondo, Bandera, Medina Lake Reservoir, Kerrville, Sisterdale Comfort, all the way up to Blanco and Fredericksburg. North Texas, East Texas, the coast, the valley, not even considered abnormally dry. They're A-OK. -okay. We've been dealing with this bullseye of drought for many months, and it's hard to pull out of it. If we don't pull out of it by this spring, you know it's going to persist through the summer. That's the nature of our weather around here. Once the heat high settles in, it's hard to break from it too much. Here's our next chance of rain, this beautiful counterclockwise swirl, that classic comma shape of the clouds. That's the upper level disturbance moving into California. That's slowly pushing its way down the West Coast and will then give us a little energy and that cold front Monday night. But the overall rainfall potential still is not in our favor. We have this one little blip of an opportunity for rain, and that's Monday night. There's going to be moisture and precipitation out there. Unfortunately, most of it's not going to be in our neck of the woods. Temperature wise, get ready for some changes. A bit of a roller coaster ride. Warmer mornings this weekend back into the 60s, even nearing 70 Monday morning. That's with higher humidity. And then we get into next week and you'll want the sweatshirts or jackets for the kids at the bus stop again. Mid 40s for morning temperatures by Wednesday and Thursday. Dew points in the 50s right now, but that southeasterly wind that you've been noticing throughout the day, increasing the humidity because it's pushing that air off the Gulf of Mexico. And our mugginess will increase. You'll notice it tomorrow. It's going to rise even more on Sunday. So muggy on our Easter Sunday. And then Monday is going to be some kind of, it's going to be the kind of humidity we haven't felt in a while with dew points approaching 70. At that point, you're in the muggy to almost oppressive levels. However, it's short lived. Check out that dew point drop and that humidity swept away again from the cold front. So by Tuesday of next week, you won't even be thinking of mugginess. And actually, if you want, you can just open the windows in your house again and let some of that fresh pollinated air <laughs> circulate. Oak still high. It's over 8,000 today and it's probably going to stay high next week as well. So the humidity returns for tomorrow and all the way through Easter and Monday will be in the low 80s tomorrow, mid 80s on Easter. And I do want to point out low morning clouds every day. So gray mornings tomorrow through Monday with some morning fog and a little bit of mist, especially on Easter Sunday and, Mon and even into Monday. So a little bit of dampness, but no real rain. And it's not going to be all soggy and wet, just a little of dampness in the air. Then we get into next week. A lot of sunshine. Let's just cross our fingers that that can last all the way through the total solar eclipse mm -hmm. on April 8th. It's still too early to pin it down. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. We'll be right back. Gas prices are going up, and AAA says it looks like that trend will continue through the spring. According to AAA, the early spring surge in oil prices was likely caused by Ukraine targeting Russia's oil infrastructure, but gas prices will now likely resume their usual slow and steady seasonal increase with spring break and summer vacations ahead. Now, today's national gas average, according to AAA, is $3.53. Texas's average is lower. It's $3.15. So let's take a look at some county averages. Bear County has the lowest at an average $3 a gallon. Cobalt County, just a few cents higher at $3.03. Medina, $3.10. And Carnes County is at an average $3.23. We'll be right back. That is all our time. Hope you have a wonderful Easter weekend and thanks for watching. Enjoy it. Enjoy it with your family. We'll see you on the night beat.